Oh, yeah, basically, it ain't no good when you get it. Yeah. Um, you have to do stuff, to, to, and you get mutations in the genetics from the male side because of how you have to sterilize it, as David said. So one of the things we want to be able to show is how badly bottlenecked we are to get them to open up and let us start bringing some new genetic material in. If we have to isolate it first like we did with the Russian bees and work from there, that would be a better thing for us. Um, improved conservation management of non-apis bees. Um, it's a very, very good thing for us to do. And don't worry about it, she didn't get a whole lot of money out of this thing. Um, improved conservation management of non-apis bees on different levels, particularly with the bumblebees. And we want to be able to have a comparative analysis of the economics of non-apis bees doing certain pollination tasks. And uh, take my word for it, it's probably going to come out and benefit people who are keeping acres strain bees. Um, fourth goal, to have an ex basically a highly available, very understandable extension program. Um, Dr. John Skinner at Tennessee is handling that, <coughs> and we want to look at using the e-extension, which means if you've got access to the internet, you will eventually have access to all this data pull it down in the comforts of your own home and use these components. Um, knowledge of genetics to improve bee breeding is going to be out there for us. Uh, laying the groundwork for a sustainable market for improved queens is one of the things that they hope is going to be easily available out here for the uh, go forward. There's an example of the extension news for uh, uh, information access. Uh, the e-extension system is up and working, and you can go out there and find a lot of stuff just besides honeybee stuff on it now. Um, here are the dollars. As you can see, a big chunk, not quite 50% of it, was allocated to mitigate CCD problems. Uh, second biggest chunk is going toward genetics, to look to bees that have good genetics that are going to show us that they can benefit us in either helping us control the mites uh, or whatever. Uh, bees that are resistant to chemicals, one of the things they're looking at. Um, if you look around there, the administrative cost and, and university overhead, that's one of the things people don't understand. If you don't work in the university environment, you don't understand that uh, the University of Georgia uh, would, oh yeah, and right now it's 40%. If you're a researcher and you go fish up a grant, the university can reach out and take 40% of that money right off the top and put it into the school, anywhere they want to go with it. In this case, they got 17.3% um, because they had an already established contract at that level and Keith did a masterful job of sneaking it through the back door on it. And uh, they were not able to get reach out and take that great big handful out of there that they normally can. <laughs> Um, competitive grants that are out there are one of the good things. That's where a lot of the small investigative work's being done, and they're doling this money out, and they're doling it out to beekeepers like a lot of them in here. Small folks that they can string a lot of data together from across the country. Um, we've got a science advisory board uh, from people all over the, uh, the United States, Canada, Brazil, Sweden and stakeholder boards, and you'll recognize a lot of names up there. Virginia Webb from Georgia is up there. Um, very familiar people there that are on that stakeholder board. And I'll skip through that. One of the long-term goals is to restore large and diverse populations of managed bee pollinators across the U.S. to sustain natural and agricultural plant communities. Pretty lofty goal, and hopefully we'll be successful at it. Now, let me bring something up here. And you know, bear with me just a few more minutes. As we said, there's been some interesting discoveries. Uh, Johnson at the University of Nebraska and his staff have looked at the effects of viruses on bees, and they see that bees that are affected with viruses have what they call loose RNA fragments. And I told you we were going to get deep on this stuff. But this is a little more simple than it seems. This can explain a lot 
slow buildup, weak immune, what we call sorry bees. All these bees show that they've got all these loose strands of RNA floating around. Well, through a new technology called RNA suppression that's been out there, it's actually being used right here in Georgia right now. An Israeli company is working on this silencing technology. They're working in Florida and Georgia with it. And they have shown that they can actually reverse the symptoms, symptoms of the Israeli acute paralysis virus in honeybees. Now, so what? They can treat one thing with it. Well, the most practical outcome of our genomic technology that we've seen, and anything that we have a genome mapped for, this technology is applicable. Now, that's one of the neat things. It's pretty simple technology in being able to apply it. The research background, how we have to map the genetics of the disease, the pathogen, a parasite, whatever. If we can get these things, we can actually go into, as they say, we may be able to take the genetics of the role, the role mite. How many of y'all familiar with screw flies? There's some old folks in here. I see Gary, you nodding your head. Way back when, we took screw flies and irradiated them, sterilized them, and turned them loose. This kind of technology, basically, if you take a varroa mite, we can turn off something in its genetics that's permanent and put it out there and let it start reproducing and literally propagate that gene for the whole population of varroa mites that may cause them to die in a certain life phase or just decide they don't like honeybees. I mean, there's a lot of advantages to this kind of research, and that's what this money is being spent on. Um, and I own honeybee decline. Well, folks, I'm sorry, the rest of the world basically is not having a problem losing honeybees. There was an extensive amount of research done over the past two years. Two places in the world that are losing honeybees, the United States and Russia, former Soviet countries. Both of us have used a lot of pesticide products in agriculture. We've used a lot of pesticide products on our bees. Now, I'm not saying that's good or if it's bad, but that was something that when they started looking at the data of where bees are going out the window on us, that's a big thing that they found. Now, what are we doing different? One of the big things also there is migratory beekeeping. And they think that may very well be a major issue. So one of the things that the CAP program is doing is it's setting up a coast-to-coast -coast series of stationary apiaries. And they're going out and they're monitoring those bees monthly for just the common stuff we monitor honeybees for. Just the normal going zones. And they're going to turn around and take the data from those sentinel colonies and compare it to a sister project being run by Jeff Pettis from USDA that's going to take a look at the effects of migratory bees and compare them to stationary bees. Something nobody, it's a simple research nobody really ever thought of. And hopefully that's going to give us an indication. Are there some bad things that we're doing in our migratory beekeeping that are causing us problems? And it should show up pretty quickly. And with that, that's all I've got for you. I hope that enlightened y'all as to how this full point three, four, three million dollars is being spent. Um, it's being spent well. There's results coming in. Um, hopefully, as we go further down the road, we're going to get some more understandable and more effectual data in. It's going to be able to be put to work right away to help both non or commercial beekeepers and non-commercial beekeepers alike. Any questions? Talking about the non apis bees, apis bombus is bumblebee. Wouldn't that make bumblebee an apis bee? No, no. it's not a uh, bombus. None of the bombus are apis species bees. So I don't understand that because uh, the, the first word is apis in, in the bumblebee. No, it's not. It's not. No, it's bombus. Yeah. The first bombus is a species, just like apis is. It's a bee, but it's not in the honeybee 
part of the, that's where you got the. Apis bees are in the tribe of the Apini, and there's 33 families in the Apini, and 17,000 17, total. Yeah, but Bombas is completely separate. 